Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our listeners. Welcome to our viewers. Uh, this is another episode of The Edge from the SSE Forum. Um, very happy to have David Morimano on with us. Um, David's a person that I met face to face actually in Abbey Road for an event uh, in 2023. I uh, really enjoyed it, really enjoyed the topic of conversation that he had um, and thought it'd be really useful to have him on the, on the SSE Forum podcast. Um, so, so, David, the same as I ask everyone um, that comes on as a guest, give us a little bit of background about yourself, kind of walk us through your journey. And let's talk a little bit about how you got to where you are today. Yeah, I can definitely do that. The, uh, the story of my journey definitely uh, can be a little lengthy. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to hit the highlights. But if there's anything you want to like dive into, it's all fair game. So uh, I'll give a, I've been in this space uh, probably a little more 20 years. Um, and I like to, when, when people ask kind of how I got into this, because it's not probably your normal process. <laughs> I like to kind of go back to when I was a kid. Um, this was probably the early nineties. Um, I was probably about, probably about five, six years old. And we grew up in an area in the States where we weren't necessarily, uh, uh, privilege by any means. Like we, we were pretty, pretty much on the, the low, uh, income scale. Didn't have a lot. Now we had what we needed, but we didn't have any extra anything. And, uh, really, really, really had a desire to get into technology and like get a computer and get a, get a VCR and get all this cool stuff. And, uh, so what I did is I actually started taking the bus um, to the, the local library, the public library, and tried to learn a few things and it wasn't quite working. It wasn't my style. I couldn't just pick up a book and read and learn anything. So I started on the way home looking at people's trash and garbage and finding components and finding parts and finding things that people were just tossed. And I found VCRs, I found televisions, I found game consoles, I found anything I could find and basically just took it home, ripped it apart, tried to fix it, take this part from that part and started diving in deeper and had did that for a couple of years until I finally got a full computer together and got everything I needed, taught myself how to install uh, you know, Windows and I did DOS and just kind of really dove into that. And I'm a kid, so I'm just kind of playing and having a heyday and think it's awesome. And then uh, fast forward, until I was about 15, um, I went around to a, a mall in the States and found a guy who was starting up a computer shop. And I just offered to work for him if he could just teach me. I work for free. Just, just show me what you know. Show me how to do this. Show me how to do that. And uh, so I did that for a couple of years. And then I actually needed to make money at some point. So I actually started uh, at my, my young teens uh, working at Pizza Hut. And within a couple, within about a year and a half working at Pizza Hut, I became a manager and was really sick of doing that kind of work. I, 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 I wanted to get back into technology. So I told them, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be looking for another job. I want to leave. And then they offered me an opportunity to, at the time, everybody was on dial-up internet. And we were going to transition the stores to using satellite. So I actually got involved in a project just to kind of have, get my feet wet um to connect satellites replace dial-up networks and kind of go down that path and then fast forward a little bit further uh, i needed uh met my wife we had our first kid and i needed to make more money as kids tend to force you to do so i left that and kind of worked with a guy a really good guy um, and we started our own computer shop got our own little business uh, it was actually his but I, I worked underneath him and learned a lot from him um, but then my wife got pregnant and had another kid and I need to make a little bit more money. So <laughs> left that aside and actually where it starts to transition into security and identity is kind of this next jump where I went to look, work for a company uh, based in the States. They're, they're a handbag company and focus mostly on uh, women's handbags. And they were opening um, uh, stores across the country in malls. And they happened to use the same registers that I had gotten familiar with at Pizza Hut, where I learned how to, you know, connect them and, and build, you know, put together the software and get all of that. So I actually volunteered. I'm like, hey, I, I want to do that. I know those systems. 
I'll go around, I'll, I'll travel the country and go to all the malls and, uh, you know, set up all the networks. And it was at that time I started getting familiar with like retail IT and working with people and working uh, very, very closely with the technology and, and tying things back to PCI and, um, you know, managing people's uh, process for their credit cards and making sure that everything's secure and safe and really kind of took that and really started running with that and really enjoyed that. Um, but as the story continues, my, my wife had got pregnant again <laughs> and found myself needing, uh, to, to up the, uh, income a little bit more. And so I looked around and I went to a hospital, uh, started working for a regional hospital system, uh, where I'm located. And at that time I was transitioning more into security, got involved in HIPAA, um, started, um, getting more into device management started going down that path. And, you know, I started doing that for a while and realized that I really, really enjoyed working on the security side, in particular, the identity side. I really liked ensuring that people who came into the environment had what they need, they had a pleasant experience with their onboarding. They, they you know, were able to do the things they needed to do and do it in a secure way. Because I saw the benefit when working at the hospital of that being something that was actually at play. Um, however, the regional hospital couldn't quite uh, accommodate the role that I really wanted to have full time because I was doing a split role. Um, so I left that and work, went and worked for an insurance company for quite a few years and was able to fulfill that role and really enjoyed what I was doing. And I got involved at the time. I was one of the first people um, in the country that was able to get exposure to CyberArk when CyberArk came to the state and dove in and really liked CyberArk and, and went down the PAM route and really just learned everything I could about privileged access management and went to uh, my first CyberArk impact conference. It was in Orlando, Florida. There was a hurricane coming and very few people showed up. <laughs> it was not a very big event that year. Um, it was one of their first impact conferences. And I met a guy uh, who worked for an oil company. We just struck up a conversation and told him about all the stuff I was doing and building and writing for CyberArk and structuring, and then transitioned uh, to me flying back from that conference. I get a phone call from that same guy and gave me a job offer to move across the country and work for him. And, you know, fast forward a couple more years, I moved back to the insurance company and then moved, decided I wanted to do something even bigger and hopefully greater with my career. And, end up uh, moving on to Integral Partners, who's a consulting uh, firm within the identity space. So that is the very cliff note version of my journey, but it all started with digging in trash. <laughs> I, I mean, it's a great story. It started digging in trash, and then every time you decided to have a child, you got a different job. Um, I'm not oh, yeah. Sure that's great <laughs> career advice. <laughs> uh, no, it, it, uh, I, I wouldn't say that it is, but it, it was a good, uh, I'm the kind of person, if one thing's going to change, you might as well change everything. Yeah, I mean, f for me, identity underpins everything we should do with security. Absolutely. Uh, but but I, what is it about the identity space that excites you? What is it that, that like keeps you getting up in the morning and and, and and means that you come on things like this and you want to talk about it. What is it that kind of gives you that buzz? Um, so to, to be honest, it's probably a little bit more uh, rudimentary than probably how most people would answer this. But it's really the thing that excites me is that I know that what I'm doing not only is to the betterment of an organization or to a company, but it's really to the betterment of the employee, of the person that's there. It's there, it is very uh, involved, it's across the board, it's in everything. And we'll talk about zero trust, I'm sure, and we'll talk about uh, quite a few things. But at the end of the day, identity and access management is very people centric. And, you know, we'll, we'll talk about bots and we'll talk about service accounts and all these non carbon based life forms that we still have to manage through the process. But if you really boil it down, it's the enjoyment that I get knowing that. I'm actually helping someone or the intent is to help someone do their job more efficiently, more securely, and be able to remove friction when it comes from the security perspective. Because I'm under the belief, and I completely disagree with, you know, if you go back many years where they would say, you know, convenience and security, they don't mix. They're like oil and water. 
I don't necessarily agree with that because I feel like if they don't mix, you're causing a bigger issue. If you don't make things uh, convenient for the individual to do their job securely, by human nature, they're going to start scapegoating things. They're going to start going around things. They're not going to follow process. And, you know, we can go into a pretty deep discussion around that as far as a philosophical view of it. But I believe and always have believed that security and convenience have to mix. And if we aren't getting them to mix, if we don't make things secure in a convenient way as leaders in the space, we're not doing a good enough job. We're not, because we're not meeting that objective, which is to secure the process, secure the individual in what they're doing, secure their job, secure I mean, the organization. And if we start putting walls up, people are gonna jump the wall, they're gonna go around the wall, they're gonna find some ways, but we have to allow them a way to do what they need to do and have it in a, as much as possible, a convenient way. Otherwise, people are just going to go around it, and they they have. And that's why we have a lot of the issues we do today. Both myself and John talk a lot about simplicity, and that's very much convenience, right? We we talk a lot about there are so many tools available to us as as IT or cyber folks, that, and and there's so much complexity, and there's gray areas, and where does one tool end, and where does one tool begin, and who's responsible for something, and are there gaps? For me, mm-hmm. identity is the place to start. And John, I don't know if you want to add anything. Yeah, I mean, identity is the core. It, as the uh, old CISO that I used to work with, it's uh, the new firewall, the new perimeter um, that we need to build our future upon. Um, I do want to dive into a little bit of the convenience factor um, because that has been a challenge for, in my experience in the past. So, as you're thinking of it, um, you know, if you're talking to an administrator or even, you know, a standard employee, um, how can you help them out with identity? Because either, you know, you got a complex password, multiple passwords. Um, if you're an admin, then you've got your standard account. And a lot of times they like that standard account to have a, a additional privileges. How do you kind of lay it out to them um, to not only make it secure, but also convenient? Yeah, I think that, so there's there's a couple ways to to answer that. And unfortunately, and fortunately, I guess it goes both ways. Um, Every organization I talk to is, is, is different from the next. The way that they structure it, their leadership, the way they look at it, what they value, what they consider a risk. Um, But at the end of the day, the way that I talk to a lot of these groups is if if you put yourself in the shoes of that, of that person conducting their job, um, anything that's going to interrupt just the flow of them getting that task done is going to be perceived as the frustration, as friction. And so what we need to do, where we need to start is understanding what those are. Don't, don't start with putting a tool in. Don't start with trying to solve a problem that we really can't comprehend what the real issue is. We obviously organizations have risks and we need to tackle them and we need to, you know, go after some of those big hitters, but to really take advantage of what I think is core to identity is we need to go back to the individuals, the people doing those tasks, the people doing those jobs, understand what their workflows are, understand the hops that they're going through um, and understand that at the end of the day, if we can just remove those hops, remove those frictions, remove those frustrations, make things a little more seamless, Um, that not only will they be happier in their role and, you know, you can maybe retain talent longer um, because I think there are some building and compounding factors to why people leave an organization, Um, but you will make people more efficient and more consistent. And I think consistency is really the key because even if we're all doing something incorrectly, if we're incorrectly doing it, but doing it consistently, it's easier to fix. Um, we can we can fix an issue quicker and more timely. So where I'd like to start, what I do is let's go back, let's, let's talk with these people, let's do a discovery, let's do workshops and sessions, let's shadow, let's learn what they're actually doing. Because I've encountered too many times where they're like, let's just put a tool in, or let's just put a process or put a standard or put a policy in. And they don't really comprehend how that affects the people doing their job day to day. Now, I'm not saying that you want to automate and repeat and, and solidify bad practices because you're going to discover those bad practices through 
um, through this process. But most of the time, not all the time, but most of the time, those bad practices are at play because people are trying to make things more convenient for themselves. Um, so that's kind of where I'd like to start. Now, technology has advanced over the last few years to make things a little bit more convenient from the fact of, you know, password lists and there's options out there for face ID and touch ID and trying to make things a little cleaner and easier. But just because the technology exists doesn't mean we shouldn't go back to those individuals and learn what their actual frustrations are. Because I've encountered folks um, on the EPAC side, you know, the electronic physical access security side, where it seems awesome that they've got a badge and that's easy just to badge. But, you know, the fact they've got to take the time and badge here, badge here, and badge here, and badge here, it, it's an inconvenience for them. So we go back and we look at, well, why are we needing to do that? Why are we needing to go through this? Are we putting too much restriction where restriction is not needed, but maybe not enough restriction where restriction really is needed and get away from these un umbrella uh, processes and procedures without actually understanding who's under that umbrella. Like at, at the end of the day, that's what we need to do. We need to go back to the individuals, go back to the tasks, go back to the processes and understand who they're affecting and why people are doing what they're doing. And to me, that's, that's pretty elementary, but it's something that I don't, see a lot of people do it's something that gets just kind of skipped over and we're just like here's the new policy follow it <laughs> i love that approach i mean it's it's more taking a business analyst uh, uh methodology so. to solving the problem rather than hey we've got a new tool or hey i went to this conference and heard this and we're gonna do that um so where was i gonna go with the next question <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I've, I've got where, a question. I've this is where one. we edit. This is where we edit things. I was going to say, so I've got go a, ahead. I've got a question whilst you're thinking. So, I mean, a lot of the times I talk at conferences, and John, I I know you're the same. We we quite often talk about getting back to the basics. I mean, mm -hmm. I've worked in the industry long enough to to know that the amount of companies that just take tool A and either just renew tool A or buy tool B to match what tool A did before they actually go back in and look at was was and is tool a doing what they need it to do the business has moved forward people have moved forward processes have changed why are you just replacing tool a with tool a i mean it's the same with a car right you're used to driving a certain car do you just continually buy a five seat a car or a seven seat a car when suddenly there's only two of you it's always for me it's always about going back and looking at what is the actual requirement and yeah. I, I think you're right. People don't tend to do that. And I think the world's changed. The pandemic came along. Things are different. Cyber is different. We talk about security now as a thing that we initiate the conversation with versus something that we think about afterwards. And a lot of the tools that we've implemented over the years, we've then gone, oh, we need to make them secure. How do we do that? So I think identity is 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 an area where if you get that right, you've built a really good foundation to build everything else on. Um, so so to get to my question, where do you, well, I'm going to ask a twofold question. How many people do you think have already determined that identity is the right path to go on? And the second part is, where does that path kind of start? Is there a defined path for people or is it different? Um, yeah, so the, so the first part of that question about, you know, you know, how many people have determined that this is the right path? I think it's, I think it's a, it's, I think it's a little bit before that. I think people are still struggling to understand that that is the right path. And I think it's because there's, it's like a, a sensory overload. If you're a CISO or, you know, you're a, a CEO or you're, you're in some sort of leadership. And like you said, people go to the conferences and they're cramming, you know, tools and they're saying this and they're saying that here's the new buzzwords. Here's this, here's that. It seems very much like a, kind of an overload. And if you don't understand what identity and access management really is and the value it can provide by following it appropriately, it's kind of hard to say people have determined that that is the right approach and that is the right thing to, to tackle. I do think it is uh, the awareness and the education and the growth of identity, the pandemic in particular, has really kind of pushed that forward. But it's only, I think, in still a very tunneled vision. When I talk to identity to a lot of CISOs, they're talking about, well, you know, 
people can sign on here or sign on there. If you're talking that that's Active Directory and we've got Active Directory and we're good. It's like, it's very, these the very pinpointed understanding. And the comment that was made earlier about, you know, identity being the new perimeter. And that's a statement that's been around for quite some time. Um, really what that means is if people say that don't really understand what they're saying. Like they think just because I put multi-factor in front of my users and they all are forced to use multi-factor, now we're good, you know? But really when we talk about that, we need to look at the identity as just that. This is an identity representation of one of my employees, of one of my contractors in my organization. And I need to be able to look at that identity and be able to tell who they are. I need to be able to tell what their role is. I need to be able to tell all the things that they should and should not be doing based on that role. And I need to be able to have a quick and easy way to respond when behavior is put in play that's abnormal. Like it's perfectly fine for one user to do task A, but if they do task B and that's abnormal, we need to have some quick way to respond. And it gets a lot more technical than that, obviously. We could spend a whole session just talking about that piece of it. But to answer that first question is, I think there are very few folks that truly understand that that's the path they need to go down because they think they don't quite grasp what identity and access management really is holistically. And that's why I kind of go back to the grassroots of understanding the individuals and the tasks. And what you do is you take that as a foundation and you keep building your understanding up and you'll be able to tackle you know, identity and access management holistically across your organization because it's not really just that identity is in everything. Identity is everything in my mind. You know, it's it's down to the people and it's down to the task, it's down to the process and you just keep building. So I do think it is more than it has been. And I do think it will continue to grow the folks that understand or that want to make it kind of their, their next task, their next journey. But to say that, you know, the vast majority quite comprehend that, I think it's still very few that really comprehend it. And then as far as like that starting point, like in that journey, I honestly believe it's not a one size fits all. I, I talk to many different organizations and I always say that we're all trying to tackle the same objectives, but we're all gonna have to do it in our own different way. Uh, a company that does manufacturing versus a company that does financials versus a higher ed versus you know XYZ type company we all technically have the same general objectives. We're trying to be more secure. We're trying to provide a, an environment that's easy to, to work in. We're trying to provide an environment that uh, so basically enriches and empowers our employees uh, by keeping that, but also keeping them secure. But we're all gonna have to do it in somewhat of a different way, a different view to be successful. So I think there are some key starting points and I think there are some key ending objectives but the journey in the middle, I think, is kind of a choose your own path. And that path is determined by going back and determining your use cases, your requirements, your, you know, your, your uh, complexity that you're trying to work in. Um, so I, I really just recommend anyone, it doesn't matter how far you think you are in your journey, take a step back, go down, go down to that foundation, discover your requirements, talk to your people, build up the actual story that you're wanting to tell the beginning and the end, and then write the middle with your employees, write it with your organization, be able to get people empowered and understand why this is important. I, I think so let's, it's, sorry, go on, John. Yeah, I was going to say, you mentioned foundation, middle, journey. Um, let's talk a little bit about one of the challenges with identity, and that's technical debt. Um, as people Absolutely. change roles, um, say somebody works in marketing, then they work in finance, and oh my God, they make the change to IT security. Um, they accumulate privileges over time, and or you have an acquisition where now you have a new identity uh, mechanism. Um, maybe it's maybe it's AD, maybe it's Ping, and, and you've got to federate those or bring those together. Um, and then on top of that, service accounts. Are there some best practices that you could recommend to folks uh, regarding this middle journey? Because I think that's where we get in trouble with identity, um, people with additional privileges, or maybe there's a service account that hasn't had its password changed in, I don't know, 36 months, um, and it's well known and somebody leaves the company and so on and so forth. Um, how how do you work with leadership to prioritize hey, we need to spend some time on this uh, and maintain it uh, and, and not go on to the next shiny thing. 
Yeah, it's, that's a really good, and it's, it's kind of a tricky thing because the, the next shiny thing is definitely shiny and gets people's attention. <laughs> and it's kind of hard to keep people kind of grounded on, on what we're trying to accomplish. And, you know, you mentioned, you mentioned tech debt. Tech debt, I think, takes many forms. And one of those that you kind of touched on where I have an individual who's been in the organization for many years and we've transitioned from role to role to role and you get this, you know, this, this role or permission bloat that occurs where they've got permissions to do all kinds of things. And, you know, your, your question kind of has mul multiple facets to it. You know, you mentioned about, you know, kind of what are some best practices to stay on top of, but then also what are the things to keep people from looking at the next shiny thing? So, I mean, some core just general best practices is that you really should at some periodic basis reevaluate what people have access to and if they're actually using it. Don't just go off of the manager saying, yes, they should keep it, but look and see if they actually need it. You do some sort of discovery in your environment periodically to know that you know, passwords haven't changed or they're not following a policy or they're not following a process. You have to do some sort of self-auditing and self-checking and self-policing. Um, and really, we could talk about a whole slew of best practices, but you know, everyone's going to be at different levels of maturity and may not be able to tackle those best practices in their fulfillment uh, or in, their, in the, the way they need to be fulfilled. But I always go back to, you know, let's just go back and, and look at the environment. Let's periodically ask ourselves, ask our managers, ask our individuals if they're using the accesses that they are. Back it up with logs and discoveries and scans. You know, get a picture of what's actually happening in your environment. To me, that's, where, that's one of the best practices to start with. Then based on what that picture is, ensure that, you know, credentials are rotating appropriately. Ensure that there's a split and some segregation between your standard access and your privileged access. It's no problem if a standard user needs privileged access, but, but have a split, have a way to consume that access or, or do some sort of just-in-time provisioning where that access is granted through some sort of elevation process. Um, and there's ways to tackle that, but really it comes down to the procedures, the processes, the policies, and the standards. If we know what we want our people to do, we need to go back and ensure we know what they're actually doing and then find a way to enforce what we want them to do. Um, and as far as the keeping them from looking at the next shiny thing, it really comes down in my mind to having a official governance process and a governance board that we are periodically reviewing our requirements and our standards collectively and getting them to have some sort of voice to say what's important to them. Because that new shiny thing may actually add us some value, but maybe it's not the right time to bring it in. Maybe we need to mature a few key things and then bring it in, then we can see its worth. Um, so I really, I recommend any organization have some key players, some key stakeholders, that really understand that the goal is to, the betterment of the business as well as the betterment of you know, the, the employee when it comes to their process. Put them on a governance board and allow them to continually on some periodic basis review those requirements, review those standards. Are these still important to us? Have we, have we completed these? Have we, um, you know, have we made any type of uh, improvement to this? Now that is a in my mind, also a tricky slope because you don't want to just throw every issue at the at the board either. Um, you have to also empower people at a lower level, like a working group that could, can handle the day-to-day -day decision making. So what, what I'm talking about is have that group that does the day-to-day -day decision making, but those bigger directional things, are these still the use cases that mean something to us? Are these still the requirements that mean something to us? Does this align with our organization's vision, with our company's vision? Let uh, a group of people weigh in and allow them to set the direction, not just an individual who sees the shiny thing at the conference and wants to buy it and buys it. <laughs> so in regards to who owns a project like this, mm -hmm. is it your CIO? Is it your CISO? Is it a wider team? I mean, we've talked a bit about it being a journey and there needs to be a start and an end, but we don't quite know like the exact route in the middle. But who owns it? Who decides where we are today, where we need to go in that journey? Like Because I've seen many projects where if they don't have a specific owner, mm -hmm. they, they just don't get done. But to me, this feels a bit more than just an IT project. It is, a, it is definitely larger than an IT project. And I think, it's, I think if you're going to do this right, 
um, in my opinion, is it's a partnership between IT and it's a partnership between the business. Because when we go down and we talk identity, identity is in everything and it is everything across the organization. And if it's only IT that runs it or it's only security that runs it, what we're doing is all the way back to the beginning of a call where we were talking about those frictions and those items that get put in and the lack of convenience because we're not understanding what the business is trying to accomplish and how they're doing it. So you need stakeholders together with a, with a partnership and ownership. Now, as far as those driving factors, the people that are really driving it forward, I mean, most of the time I see these type of projects sit under the CISO um, and they're the ones who are driving the effort, but there needs to be partnership with the business. There needs to be either some sort of combined ownership or have at least key stakeholders from the business set on some sort of governance board to provide a voice. Um, but at the end of the day, if it's just one group, if it's just IT, if it's, if it's just security that are gonna try to run with this and they're not gonna bring in the business, it's going to cause friction. And I see projects fail all the time and fail. It's interesting if I ask a project management project manager about a failed project is the project doesn't necessarily fail because they keep changing what success all the way through it. Uh, but if, if you go back and look at it, you know, after the, the dust has settled, I mean, you could call the project a failure if it did not meet those key objectives. And I see that too many times as the project manager keeps redefining success as we go through it, because we get pushed back from one area, pushed back from another area. There was this pitfall and that pitfall. And you're going to encounter pitfalls and struggles through any project, but you have to go back to who you're affecting. You're affecting the business. Get their voice heard initially. Um, get their voice uh, to the table. Understand what it is. And then make this a partnership, not a dictatorship where you're just saying, you know, here's the new policy. Here's the new tool. You're going to do it. That, that, that doesn't work nowadays. It, it just doesn't. No, I think that's a great answer because, I mean, like I said, both me and John have seen projects fail we've seen them change in scope and i mean i've seen it's a bit like when you set out to build a cake and you end up with lasagna i mean you haven't you might you might get something that's edible but it wasn't what you set out to to, to achieve absolutely um, we're getting short on time i mean it's been great so far and i i i really wanted to talk to you about zero trust but i'm not sure we have too much time um so i, I definitely want to introduce uh, invite you back for episode number two um, but before yeah. we get on to the fun questions, if you could give one piece of advice to a company that is is looking at identity, what would it be? Um, so if I had to give them one piece of advice is, is don't rush in. You know, basically have someone or have a group come in. If you've got this skill set in-house, awesome, but I recommend somebody outside of the organization come in and then just do an assessment, just do it, just do some sort of look at your environment and use their information to kind of set a strategy and set a roadmap and define your use cases before you decide to do anything. Um, identity is, can be a very daunting task and effort because it's so interwoven in everything. Um, it's, it's just, you need to have kind of a, a outsider's perspective, an outsider is probably the wrong term, but someone who has experience in what these pitfalls typically are, the things to look for, the rocks to overturn, the rugs to lift up. And I try to remind everyone, just don't approach it like you're doing an audit. Don't try to belittle anyone for their process, write them up, say they're doing something incorrect, say they're doing something bad, because that really, in my opinion, for one, isn't the right thing to do. And it doesn't give us the the camaraderie and partnership that we're ultimately going to end up looking for. So the one piece of advice is just, just don't rush in, take a step back, assess your environment, see where you really are from a complexity perspective and a maturity perspective, and then set your goals, then set your roadmap, then set your objectives. Uh, Cause if you do it the other way around, I can guarantee you, your roadmap's going to be stretched. Your budget's going to be you know, you know, budget's going to end up needing to grow because you didn't comprehend what you really needed to do. I mean, there's a huge down, you know, snowball effect of issues. Um, so that's my one piece of advice. Don't rush in, do some self-evaluation, learn what's going on in your environment, understand how complex your environment is compared to others. Don't go to another uh, 
organization and say, hey, you did that in two years, I bet I can do it in a year and a half. Because you know the complexity and what's going on in the organization is going to be different than yours. Sounds good. Anything from you, John, before we get onto the fun stuff? No, let's get onto the fun stuff. Okay, so I am going to ask you about your beard. So for anyone that's listening, please go and check out the YouTube. Um, I was impressed with your beard when I met you. How long did you take to grow that? Um. Uh, so so I've always had a, like a real close beard for many years. I would say probably started in probably the beginning of summer of 2023, and uh, you know, that's so that's what about uh, probably about nine months now. I mean, this is uh, this is January and. I'd say about that's probably been about eight months. I'd say eight months if I had to land on a, a time period. I'd have no chance. Firstly, mine would be mostly gray, and secondly, it will be all <laughs> patchy. Um, but one other question before I let John have a question. You mentioned earlier that you worked in Pizza Hut, so my yeah. fun question is always going to be around <laughs> pizza. I'm a I'm a very I'm a lover of pizza. I worked in a pizza restaurant when I was a child. Uh, I've spent a lot of time in Italy. And me and John uh, have quite a big uh, difference of opinion on whether pineapple should uh, exist on pizza. Or well, not. I, I don't. I don't. I think it's more than that. You, you, you live in the UK. I'm here in Portland, Oregon. Portland, Oregon. We tend to be a little more um, adventurous about our pizza, so we put lots of different things on our pizzas. Um, so it's it's a little more than pineapple, but that generally tends to be the, the topic yeah we just disagree <laughs> with the pineapple so be very very careful how you answer this but um should pineapple be on pizza um so so when i when i worked at pizza Hut, i can tell you nobody ordered pineapple on pizza uh it was just not a thing however i would say having tried pizza with pineapple um it it a pizza should not exist with only pineapple. It depends what it's paired with. So if it's paired with the right ingredients, I think it can work. But if you're just going to slap pineapple on a pizza, it's it's not a, it's a no go. You got to know what you're pairing it with. There you go. <laughs> See, I'm not sure I agree with you, but I I will bow in this case to maybe John's more food experience and the next time i i meet with john face to face no doubt you will see a picture of me uh investigating how well pizza is with pineapple and other things i think um, it depend it depends on where we go and um where we mm -hmm. meet up so if it's a good pizza location we can probably find you a solid option here uh if it uh, is you know sorry pizza hut um if it's pizza hut <laughs> Uh, uh, I, I, I'm, experiences I'm there may with, not yeah. be awesome okay yeah. so let's see where we go with that but john i'll hand over to you to ask a fun question so david what uh what part of the country are you are you from uh i'm in uh northeast indiana so almost northeast on the border indiana. of uh yeah almost on the border of michigan and ohio so right by lake Erie. Uh, all right so i think there's something called a is it a horseshoe is that ring a bell a horseshoe yeah a, a food food item Oh, um, I, I don't think I've ever heard of that. Okay, well, it's it's uh, it's a Midwest uh, experience. So <laughs> we've got uh, garbage plate, but not a garbage house. plate. All right, so let's let's dive into what a garbage plate is. Um, so typically, uh, so a garbage plate, if you go anywhere for breakfast, is basically everything on the menu on the plate. <laughs> oh my! So gosh. you've got you've got multiple eggs and uh, biscuits, and you've got uh all the sausages and all the meats and then everything's covered in gravy okay see the I thing think... that concerns me about that is your biscuits aren't what we call biscuits and your gravy is not what we call gravy but it's america yeah oh yeah <laughs> but yeah it's the gar it's that it's basically uh it's referred to as a garbage plate. i actually think it started in the northeast but uh, i'm close enough to the northeast and versus the midwest we still get garbage plates all right. So next time I'm there, I'm going to have to try out a garbage plate for breakfast. Oh, yeah, I'd, I'd recommend it. <laughs> so I, I definitely like you to come on again. Um, like I said, we I wanted to delve into a little bit of AI because it is 2024 and it's everywhere. 
We, I know you talked a little bit about it in your presentation that I heard when we were together. I definitely want to talk about zero trust. Um, so for, for our listeners and for our viewers, David will be back. Um, no doubt episode two and possibly episode three. Uh, David, it's been great. Thank you for sharing your experiences and thank you for coming on the edge. Yeah, no, it's just been awesome. I really appreciate it. And I'm looking forward to having another one. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Thank you.